public session that we are recorded and being broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and online, and that anybody, as they progress into the public gallery, uh, just to make sure that all phones are in silent or airplane mode, uh, just so that they don't interrupt with microphones. And just to let members know as well that uh, oral evidence sessions and other bits and pieces are uh, rep uh, reported by Hansard, so we'll have somebody recording that side of it as well. Just two quick items for the committee before we progress. The draft minutes uh, from our meeting from last week are presented. They're on page nine of the meeting pack. Are members content that they're a true reflection of the proceedings from last week? Okay. Uh, we'll sign the minutes then for last week. Uh, are there? There's no matters arising from our side. Any members? Any matters arising? Okay. And we can progress to the important element of the day uh, and take the opportunity to welcome the First Minister, Deputy First Minister and Junior Minister. Um, this is the first ministerial briefing uh, from, of this mandate. And I'd like to take the opportunity to thank, um, looking back, everybody's efforts in uh, preparing the new decade, new approach uh, document, which has facilitated and enabled us to get back to work. Um, and I suppose in, in that element, I was struck by the words new and approach as two key words. And I think that if we are to achieve that, then we will have to do things differently and hopefully better uh, moving forward. The um, job, obviously, of the committee is to scrutinise, um, but this can, and I will do my best to ensure that this is done uh, politely, that it's done courteously, respectfully, but in an open and transparent manner. Um, these virtues are, of course, two-way. Um, it's expected of us as committee members and from ministers. Um, and I would like to see that these briefings do happen regularly, um, because I think that it will demonstrate a certain level of respect between the executive and the assembly. Uh, but I think it will also show leadership from yourselves as first and deputy first minister to the other ministers and their interactions with other uh, committees as well. And I think that that will help us to show that there is that new approach. And I'm not naive. I know that there will be um, uh, differences. There will be differences of opinion. There will be differences of priorities. And there will be political differences. Uh, but I think we're all acutely aware that the public have asked and demanded that there is a mature and grown-up approach to politics. Uh, and I think it's our duty then to deliver that. Um, so I'm hoping that our committee here can be a beacon to the other committees uh, in the way that we're going to get work done. Um, shortly, I'll ask the First and Deputy First Minister to provide us with that short oversight and induction to their department and the priorities that are going forward, and then we can move into the questions then afterwards. So if you're happy enough, First Deputy First Minister and Junior Minister, we'll let hand over to yourselves then. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair and Members. Uh, we very much welcome the opportunity to come along uh, early uh, and to meet with the committee today to provide, um, I suppose, for some members an introduction, for some uh, a refresher uh, to our department and to the, cre the key priority work areas um, which we'll focus on during the next few months. Uh, we do, like yourself, look forward to regular and positive engagement with the committee uh, during the rest of the mandate. We do know that your primary role is to scrutinise. We accept that, um, but we also hope that we can work together in a constructive way uh, as well. Uh, we acknowledge that there has uh, been problems previously around the timely receipt of key papers in advance of evidence session, and we're going to try and work to ensure uh, that wherever possible papers will issue um, in the agreed time uh, protocols. Uh, we've already provided the committee with the first day brief, which contains a broad overview of the department and its work. Um, the committee has received briefing, uh, as I understand it, from the head of the civil service uh, just last week, and will have further briefings from our senior officials uh, across the department over the next number of weeks. So the new decade, new approach document, which you've referred to, outlines the priorities of the new executive, setting out our goal to bring positive changes to people's lives in areas such as the economy, health care, education, housing, welfare and mental health. And our department will set out a multi-year programme for government and a legislative programme 
to underpin uh, these executive priorities. And of course, we will be delivering our objectives in the context of uh, the United Kingdom having left the European Union. Uh, that in and of itself presents its own set of issues arising uh, from the protocol agreed by uh, the UK Government. Uh, and the committee will uh, be aware of some of the key concerns from the debate of the Assembly, which took place on the 20th uh, of January. There was, as you will recall, uh, unanimity that we should reject uh, the request for consent to legislate on matters which belong to this place, um, and there was common ground on the need to get the right outcome for the economy. So we're determined uh, together to protect Northern Ireland's interests, to the interests of our people and our economy. Uh, and we're going to hold the UK Government uh, to account on its various commitments, which it has made uh, in relation to uh, the New Decade New Approach document. The Deputy First Minister and I have written uh, to the Prime Minister, um, setting out our expectations of engagements on matters such as unfettered access, on which there are very clear commitments in the New Decade New Approach uh, for the Government to bring forward legislation. Uh, we've also just last week secured a commitment from the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster to a joint, um, uh, at the, sorry, at the Joint Ministerial Committee, which was in Cardiff last week, that there will be engagement on protocol matters, uh, and we both expect that that engagement um, will be political engagement, and more than that, it needs to be meaningful uh, engagement as well. So, for our part, we've established the Executive Subcommittee on Brexit, and it met yesterday. Um, the subcommittee will provide us with the forum for collective discussion on Brexit matters which have the potential to impact on our citizens, our businesses, our local economy uh, and indeed our place in the UK internal market and indeed wider markets. The committee will have an ongoing interest in our Brexit deliberations uh, and we look forward to working with you on that. And whilst Brexit and its implications are a key priority for our department, it's also important that we continue to enhance our reputation and relationships internationally, and our priorities will continue to be uh, in North America, uh, in Brussels, and of course in China. And it's something that will remain an important element uh, of our programme for government. Our three executive offices in Washington, Brussels, and Beijing play a significant part in promoting our international objectives. Uh, <coughs> equally, the international visit programme of executive ministers is important uh, in establishing our position globally. We will review our international relations strategy to ensure that we are competitive uh, in a changing international context. And turning briefly before the Deputy First Minister comes in to our own department, um, we are working within a a challenging financial environment, Chair, and uh, the Department's <coughs> opening budget for 2019-20 was £55 million, uh, and that has represented a 3.6% reduction from 2018-19, and was closer probably to 6.7% reduction after pay, price and other inescapable pressures. Uh, our budget strategy for 1920 follows the approach we've taken in previous years and seeks to address our statutory obligations, uh, meet any contractual obligations, and then take forward programme for government commitments. Um, we also have in the past protected the uh, victims' budget as well, mitigated the impact on services delivered through our armed length bodies, uh, and minimised the impact on departmental uh, programme budgets. So our key goal is to facilitate economic growth through continuing to offer jobs, attract foreign direct investment and improve uh, the skills of, of our young people. But the Department is currently managing a resource funding deficit of uh, some £2.97 million. Uh, that's 10.4 per cent uh, of our budget. Uh, and that has arisen due to a combination of budget cuts in each of the past five years, together with the impact of new and additional work which the Executive Office has taken forward, for which baseline funding has not been received. Um, and of course, that position in terms of finance has been exacerbated due to the additional work which we have undertaken, work, work which we wanted, of course, to undertake in terms of the historical institutional abuse legislation, uh, and then laterally taking on work in relation to the victims' payments, <coughs> each of which 
each of which could uh, amount <coughs> costs of between 25 million and 60 million. Um, so those are big figures, uh, and we really have to get to grips with them. And it's, it's actually not possible for the costs uh, to be absorbed within our existing budget, uh, and the source of funding for these areas will have to be confirmed as a matter uh, of some urgency. Um, the difficulty is, of course, as well, that those are demand-led pieces, and we can't really give you a definitive uh, answer uh, in relation to the funding. Uh, in addition to that, shared future funding provided as part of the Fresh Start Agreement has been, uh, had been agreed at 60 million over five years. Uh, that ends in, on the 31st of March of next year, 2021, uh, and the expiry of that funding stream will have a significant negative <coughs> impact on the delivery of outcomes and indeed uh, on communities right across Northern Ireland. So it's something that we will need to have a very serious look at as well. So meeting all of those financial challenges. Uh, is a key priority for the Department as we look forward to plan for the next financial year and beyond. Thanks, Chair, and to the Committee. Uh, we look forward to working with you in a constructive way where possible. I'm sure there'll always be a challenge, but that's, that's your function. That's OK. But we do hope that we do have a, a, a good relationship and that we have a, a regular role to play here and come along to the Committee. Can I just apologise for the Junior Minister? He just couldn't make it today, but um, he'll be here <coughs> at future um, meetings. As the First Minister said, that we, we look forward to working with the Committee across a wide range of issues, but not least working with the Committee on the Brexit issue. Um, there clearly were different starting points for a decision to recommend to the Assembly that we didn't give consent to the legislative consent motion that was requested, but there is an absolute agreement that consent should be withheld, and that was across the board, and I think that was a, a good outcome. There's common ground on the need to, to get the, the best deal that we can now for our people and for our economy, and we're both determined to do everything that we can to influence what is the next stage, the next phase of the Brexit deliberations through any means possible um, here with the British Government in Europe and with the EU itself. Our economy, the integrated nature of trade and complex supply chains will require those in negotiations to properly understand our issues here and our, our circumstances here. Any kind of surface level understanding won't be enough, so we have a big uh, work to do in terms of being able to follow that very closely and also to influence the events of the next um, 12 months. It's equally, equally important that impacts for our citizens are properly understood, that the Good Friday Agreement is protected and that we take a long-term view of the arrangements that are negotiated um, later this year. We're not interested in any sort of superficial or stick and plaster approach. Um, what we need is negotiations that deliver outcomes that enable our economy and our people to flourish. Um, I was very pleased last week, maybe it was the week before, to meet with uh, Michelle Barn here at, with, along with Minister Dodds, and we both took the opportunity to stress, with the, stress the importance of protecting the economy, and that was um, one of the, the key discussion points which we had yesterday at our first subcommittee uh, on Brexit. On matters um, closer to home, I suppose the issue of compensation for victims and survivors of historical institutional abuse is an urgent priority for the executive. 850,000 has been secured to the Jan January monitoring rounds for um, 1920, and that will enable the work underpinning the establishment of the, of the redress board um, to be completed. The ongoing budgetary discussions will not impact, so um, First Minister has highlighted the challenges that we have, but I think it's very important that we send out a very strong message to, to victims that, of historical institutional abuse that we have a statutory obligation and, and we will be paid, this money is secured and it won't be impacted by the other budgetary challenges that, that we have. So I'm sure the committee are glad to hear that, but I'm sure that, more importantly, the, the survivors are, are, are glad to hear that. The Lord Chief Justice, Sir Declan Morgan, appointed uh, Mr Justice uh, Adrian Colton as the President of the HIA Redress Board back on the 15th of November. And given the challenging time frame to establish the two arm's length bodies that we've um, we have set up Shadow Redress Board um, and it's working on the development of the processes and procedures that will allow for um, the early and effective assessment of redress applications by the multidisciplinary panels. And then the committee will know that uh, Brenton McAllister was appointed as HIA interim advocate back in July of last year and he's going to or he does provide support to victims and survivors in advance of the appointment of the statutory commissioner. Then working collaboratively, the Interim Advocate, Redress Board and TEO officials have been engaging with victims and survivors on the application process for compensation. And that process needs to be straightforward and should be straightforward, clear, easy to use and seek only the information that's needed to determine the application. 
The executive is also determined to protect the most vulnerable in our society. Our office coordinates the executive's delivering social change programme, which aims to deliver a sustained reduction in poverty and an improvement to the health and well-being and life opportunities of children and young people. We remain committed to the ongoing implementation of the executives uh, together building a united community strategy for good relations, under the banner of which we support a range of funding programmes aimed at building strong and united communities. These include the Urban Villages Initiative, the TBUC uh, Camps Programme, the Central Good Relations Fund, the District Council Good Relations Programme and the Planned Interventions Programme. Our department will also, uh, or also works with the Special EU Programmes Body to deliver the Peace 4 um, Programme, which provides in the region of €270 million Euro across the four thematic objectives, shared education, children and young people, shared spaces and services and building positive relations at local level. And we're working to develop the new Peace Plus programme, which will have a budget of at least £650 million. This will build upon previous peace and interreg programmes. SEUPB aim to have a draft cooperation plan with the Commission by June uh, of this year and a final programme agreed by the end of um, 2020. The Committee will also be aware, aware that our Department manages the Social Investment Fund, which is now in full delivery mode, having made significant progress over the last three years. <coughs> Of the 65 projects um, with committed funding, 35 capital projects and 17 revenue projects are now complete and delivering positive outcomes to local people in disadvantaged areas. And to date, over 26,000 people have benefited from these revenue projects. That's quite substantial. We recognise that there um, were certainly shortcomings, and I know some members have expressed this in terms of questions that have been asked, so there were certainly shortcomings in the early stages of SIF, although we welcome the fact that there's been an acknowledgement now from the Audit Office that governance improved once projects have been established. All Audit Office our recommendations have been accepted by the Department and the Department for Finance with agreement from all other departments. So just finally then, Chair, I want to touch on the strategic aims of the new Office of Identity and Cultural Expression um, as set out in the New Decade New Approach Agreement. These include the promotion of cultural pluralism and respect for diversity, building social cohesion and reconciliation, building capacity and resilience and how we address our unresolved cultural identity issues, and celebrate and support all aspects of the North's rich cultural and linguistic heritage, recognising the equal validity and importance of all identities and traditions. Consideration is currently being given to the arrangements to bring forward the rights, language and identity proposals um, in the new decade, new approach agreement, and I'm quite sure you'll want to have at some stage soon a detailed conversation around some of those things. So I apologise if that's probably all a bit long, but it is trying to set out the, the stall of um, everything, I suppose the breadth of things that we have to deal with, but we have to have detailed conversations on all of these things, I'm sure, over the course of the weeks and months ahead. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Ministers. And I suppose maybe there's something I, I forgot to do. And just to put in record my thanks for you delaying by an hour the start of today's no. meeting at short notice to facilitate uh, my engagement at the funeral. So I, I thank you um, for that. Um, and we'll move them to, to question. There are just a few um, points. It's sort of more slants on some of the things that we've been talking about rather than, than any new area. And obviously Brexit is going to uh, consume a lot of time within your department, within the, the mandate of this um, assembly as well. And I was just wondering if it might be possible to get a commitment from yourselves that although we have the uh, subcommittee of the executive that's dealing um, with Brexit and therefore this committee will be able to hold that to account and that there will be some external work. It's just the acknowledgement that in the past three years there's a lot of sectors out there that have been taking the lead. Um, they've been providing a lot of the research, they've been doing a lot of the groundwork, a lot of the spade work um, in the absence of the executive and assembly. And we know we've manufacturing, business, trade, agriculture and the social sector. And they've actually gathered themselves together um, and are working quite effectively. Um, and it's just that if that model is there and that level of engagement, is there a possibility for you to, uh, at the subcommittee level to be able to tap into what they're doing so that they're not <coughs> left to just sort of falter away? Because I think they've got their, their finger on the pulse of thousands of businesses and sectors across the north uh, and being able to work with them. So just to get that commitment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's actually one of the, the items we discussed yesterday at, at, at our meeting. So our subcommittee is going to have to meet probably every week, given the, the breadth of, 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 I suppose, the, the range of decisions that we'll have to take and for us to be ahead of the curveball in terms of the trade negotiation that will happen. And, and as anybody knows, in negotiation, things can move very quickly. So we're going to have to be very nimble and be able to uh, adjust to that. So. One of the, the key conversations that we had yesterday was around how do we involve stakeholders because you're absolutely right. 
Um, <coughs> we've all been on record, I think, in terms of commending the business mm. community for the, the voice which they have, the stance which they've taken, and they've been spoken out very loudly, and we've all heard them. Not everybody always agreed at all times, but we certainly, um, certainly all heard what people have to say. So I think a key part of us being able to move forward this next stage, because there is so much uncertainty, is us involved in stakeholder engagement. So we've agreed to come back to a dedicated conversation and officials are going to draft mm -hmm. a programme for engagement for next week's um, Brexit subcommittee and we hope to be able to sign off on that. But we, we recognise that as a, as a fundamental element to um, how we progress over those next 12 months. Okay, I, I, I would certainly welcome that. And again, just maybe to reiterate, just that we, we all know what stakeholder engagement is and a lot of places conduct um, stakeholder engagements, but maybe just in recognition of the extra level of work that this group of people have already done them, maybe just tapping into that to get their expertise. And I found from the conversations with them, their knowledge and their research right down to what's happening at the coal face, and, and they're very useful, so um, it's good to get the commitment that, that you'll work with them. Um, the next question I have will probably be quick, quick. It's really the issue of the historical institutional abuse payments. I, I just My ears pricked up a little bit, and I said this to David Sterling last week, and it's just to get your commitment to it as well. That the additional monies that was allocated in the finance in the January monitoring round used the term specifically that it was for a scoping exercise, and and I'm just I, I want to just keep pressing on that that you know the 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 victims that have been um, that that are from this grouping that they, they have been led up the garden path a number of times, and I know you have given real clear commitment that the payments will start and and that things will move very, very quickly, hopefully this side of the summer. But just as soon as you see the word scoping exercise, maybe it's my old days in council, you know that that can equal you know one year, two year. Can I just get a reaffirmation from yourselves about that commitment that things will start very quickly and that that scoping exercise is to assist that work and won't hold it up? Well, it's my understanding um, that this is uh, very much an obligation on, on our part. Um, we want to do it as well. Uh, it's not something that we're doing because we have to do it. Um, we believe that it is absolutely morally the right thing to do. Um, and uh, we are having continuous briefings in relation uh, to finance. But as far as I understand, that, that money that was allocated, I think it was 850000 yeah. um, was to really underpin the establishment of the redress board and then to get the commissioner in place as well. Um, we haven't seen the terms of reference for the commissioner as yet, but the interim... Um, advocate will stay in place until the commissioner is put in place. So there is continuity there. And uh, to be fair to the officials in the department, I think this is, is this is an area which they have really grasped uh, in the absence of an executive. And I know they've done a lot of work. Um, and I do pay tribute to the officials that have been involved in the HIA work. Okay, that's good. And, and just to, to add to that, I mean, one of the things that we have talked about mm. is the fact that we need to reach out to the, those institutions yeah. that also have a contribution to make. So we want to make sure that there's no stone un unturned, that we move at pace, that these people who have been um, led up the garden path in time, time and then let down so many times that this is delivered upon in the, the fastest uh, way in which we can. But we also need to make sure that other institutions uh, play their part uh, in being able to allow us to have proper funding in place in order to give people what they absolutely deserve. But just to conclude on that, I know that um, it's something that's a priority for yourselves. Uh, already from last week, it was identified as a priority for this commitment or for this committee. And I'm sure that in the, the months ahead, we will use our scrutinising role just to, to keep the pressure on that to make sure that we get delivering mm -hmm. on those payments as quickly as possible. But it's good that we're all kind of going in the same direction in that. So uh, hopefully there won't be friction there. Um, my final question then is just um, as part of the new decade new approach. I have written that down so to try and remember it. Um, we, there was conversation in the programme for government strand for that about a 17th indicator for housing. Um, I think all parties that were part of the negotiations recognised that housing is a key social issue out there within our communities, that homelessness is a, a, an issue in whatever form it presents itself in, in too large uh, numbers. We want to try and address that. And we felt that um, many of the parties in discussion that having it as a 17th indicator as part of the programme for government would be something that would be useful and helpful. And I think officials indeed within the department uh, felt that it was something that they didn't have any uh, major issues or problems with. Is there a commitment from yourselves that that's something that you are agreeable to and something that could be pursued quite quickly within the department? 
Well, I think what we're doing at the moment uh, is looking at how we bring forward the programme for government. Uh, I think it probably will be a two-stage process, Chair, insofar as we will use the outcome delivery programme that was there from the civil service and has been developed um, to allow us to move ahead. And then we will have a more strategic look at the ongoing programme for government. Um, we've had as you probably are aware, aware uh, an away day with uh, some of our ministers giving, giving presentations. Uh, the Minister for Communities did give us a very detailed presentation on housing. Um, we're looking forward to another away day, I think it's next week, uh, where we will have the remaining ministers giving us their um, presentations on the challenges and opportunities in their departments. We are trying at the executive uh, to have a whole understanding of all of the departments so that we know where all of the pressures are, where all of the opportunities are and how we can move forward together collegiately. Uh, I think that is a new approach um, and it's one I hope that you will be in favour of um, because uh, in the past there has been a lot of siloing in, in different departmental bunkers and it's not something that we think is good for the departments and I understand why in the past it has happened. People felt quite territorial about their departments but it's important for everybody, not least the, those ministers, that we have an understanding of where the pressures are in their departments and where the opportunities lie. So uh, I think we will be back with you again when we have that um, uh, phase one programme for government piece in place and of course the legislative programme in place as well um, so that we can have a conversation with you around that. Thank you. Deputy Chair. Chair, thank you. And may I echo the commitment to um, positive relations, notwithstanding the need to tackle difficult issues. Uh, constructive where possible, I think DFM I'll put it. I think we could, we could maybe all agree that a characterisation of the last three years was uh, a plummeting in public confidence in MLAs as people of integrity. So I wish to turn to the comments of um, Conor Murphy on the murder of Paul Quinn and the revelations of the last 24 hours. Under other circumstances, we could, of course, say it's a matter for Sinn Féin, but he is an executive minister. You're running a joint office, and I would suggest that you have a responsibility to protect the reputation and the integrity of the executive. So I want to ask you both, what is the best way forward to handle this? Well, I, I'm, I'm happy to take that first. I mean, we're here in our capacity as joint First Ministers, Joint Heads of Government, uh, we're here to discuss the remit of our department. But let me just say this, because it is a political issue, and let me just make uh, on the record, Chair, um, with your indulgence, just uh, uh, my views in terms of, of what the Vice Chair has raised. Conor Murphy's going to make a public statement, as we speak, actually, I believe he's making a public statement in terms of uh, his approach, where he will apologise for the remarks that he made. Um, he'll make those remarks very clearly. Uh, in terms of what he said in the aftermath of the murder of Paul Quinn back in 2007. Connor will um, state very clearly that uh, he offers those apologies to uh, Paul Quinn's mother, Breach, who um, over the course of recent days has obviously been uh, on many outlets speaking and is very hurt. And I think that's right and proper that Connor will, will offer those words of apology today. He'll also offer to meet um, with Mrs Quinn uh, and, and hopefully she will um, take him up on that. Um, Paul Quinn was, was not a criminal. Um, Paul Quinn uh, was murdered by criminals. And Connor will make that very clear on the record today. And then he will get back to doing um, his role as the, the finance minister. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and just to reiterate, of course, this isn't a departmental uh, issue. And we're here to answer uh, departmental issues today. But in terms of the political ramifications of it, I think um, now we've heard from the Deputy First Minister that the Finance Minister is apologising. I think that is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, I have met Breeze Quinn um, actually just around this time last year. Um, she was a person who was deeply hurting uh, about the murder and, and the death of her son. And I think wherever possible, uh, if mistakes are made, we should reflect, we should make apologies for those mistakes, uh, and we should make sure that those are uh, sincere apologies. Uh, and uh, I haven't heard Connor's apology, obviously, because he's only making it now. Uh, but I think it is right that that should happen. And of course, if anybody has any information uh, in relation to the murder of Paul Quinn, they should take it to the Police Service of Northern Ireland so that they can assist in the best way possible. And I'm sure uh, that Mr and Mrs Quinn would want, above all, to have justice uh, in relation to the murder uh, of their son. Uh, and that would give them the closure that they seek. 
I don't wish to labour it, First Minister, but just to be clear, you're happy to continue to work with Conor Murphy as First as Finance Minister? Uh, well, as I say, that's not a departmental issue, and as you well know, because you have a minister uh, in, uh, the in uh, government with us as well, uh, government appointments are made by the uh, departments, uh, or by the parties uh, in relation to the De Hunt, uh, process. That's how ministers are appointed. So Sinn Féin are responsible for uh, appointing their ministers, uh, and that is a matter for Sinn Féin. Okay, thank you for those answers. Um, if I can move on to Annex C of the New Decade, New Approach uh, document, there's a commitment there uh, to bring forward an ad -hoc, ad hoc Assembly Committee on a Bill of Rights, and in fact, a commitment that the terms of reference and timetable of the committee will, will be agreed within 30 working days of the restoration of devolution. By my reckoning, that leaves you 12 days. Could you update me on progress? Yeah, in relation to that commitment, and indeed a number of commitments in the New Decade, New Approach, uh, there are a, a wide range of bodies and indeed committees and structures that have to be set up within a limited period of time. <coughs> Officials are working through those at the moment. Uh, Deputy First Minister and I have received a document just today which sets out all of the commitments in the new decade, new approach, and which departments are going to be taking those forward, who's going to be responsible officer for the, all of those matters. It's uh, a huge document uh, and will take some time to work through, but we recognise that for some <coughs> of those commitments there, uh, there are time limits uh, attached to them, and I'm sure that our officials are aware that those time limits are there as well. If we go back a document to, to the Stormont House Agreement, um, there was a commitment to a comprehensive mental trauma service, which has yep. now become the Regional Trauma Network. And First Minister, I asked about this in question time recently. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was couched in the agreement as the Commission for Victims and Survivors' recommendation, so it's definitely within that sector. Mm -hmm. um, the sectors come together in perhaps an unprecedented way. I'm talking from South East Fermanagh Foundation to Relatives for Justice, mm -hmm. uh, to ask that, that there is a commitment that this service is primarily for victims and survivors rather than a general NHS service open to all. Uh, and they are seeking reassurance from you, and I think officials, particularly in health, are looking for ministerial direction to say it is primarily for victims and survivors. Can you give that assurance? Well, I think part of the issue, uh, Mike, uh, hasn't just been that it's primarily for victims and survivors, but that they wanted it exclusively for victims and survivors. And the difficulty with that was that that, as you will well know, is not how the National Health Service works. Um, it's open to all at the point of need. Um, and so, therefore, there was that bit of a, a creative tension, if you don't mind me using that term, uh, between what the National Health Service does and what uh, was in the Stormont House Agreement. Uh, officials have been working and have met with a number of the victims' groups. I think there is good progress in relation to that, and I think there is a way through. Um, and they're working through that at the moment. It's, it seems to me that it's the only outstanding issue I stand to be corrected in relation to this regional trauma network. Um, and if we can get uh, a creative way around this issue, then we can move on and uh, get it established. I think at this stage, the victims' groups would settle for primarily rather than exclusively. Yeah. I hear what you're saying, yes, and that's very helpful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it is, and, and we know that officials are actually working with the groups to try and get a resolution that actually satisfies everybody, because Arlene's absolutely right that we're trying to have this delivered. Um, it's a necessary piece of, 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 what, of what we need in society, so I think that we can find accommodation and a way forward on this, but we do need to, yeah. we need to work with the groups. Thank you. Uh, Stormont House also set up a commission on flags, identity, culture and tradition, yep. which has been meeting for nearly four years, quite expensively. Um, and has not we yet note your question, yes. And has not yet, <laughs> haven't got there yet, and has not yet reported. How does it sit with the new decade commitment to the Office of Identity and Cultural Expression with commissioners? Yes, again, um, as I understand it, that group, um, the, the FICT group, haven't really met last year uh, because I think there was a recognition that they had come to a bit of a standstill in terms of what they were trying to do without, the, without having an executive and assembly in place. As I understand it, they're meeting now in March uh, again and no doubt will be reflecting on the contents of the new decade, new approach. Uh, obviously, it's not for us to direct them, um, but we look forward to hearing what they see as the way forward uh, as well. Yeah, no, but that's, that's it. I mean, they're going to meet again in March. Um, they hadn't met, met for some time, and then we expect to get a report, a report the final report, that will also uh, be reflective of the NDNA, 
which is easier said than new day or new decade, new opportunity. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> yes, would you accept that there's a VFM, a value for money question, to be posed over fixed? Well, we know that when when the first minister referred to, we know your question because we know you've been um, sending in some written questions on this, uh, and we're we're looking at that. Um, I'm, I'm not satisfied that, of that to be the case yet, to be honest, because we are um, going to receive a briefing from officials. We'd have to work our way through all of that. Mm -hmm. But I'm very happy to respond to you on that whenever I've made yes. that consideration. Okay, f final question for May, and this goes to financial transaction capital, which yes. currently sits with yourselves for perhaps we could say technical reasons. Mm -hmm. We know from, from the finance minister over 150 million was returned. Yes. Um, I, I mean, this is an issue that I have raised with officials just earlier today, actually. Uh, in relation to the use of financial transactions uh, money because um, it's something that we had hoped we would be able to make more use of. I think we've talked about housing, uh, the fact that there needs to be a reclassification for us to be able to use that FTC money, I think uh, is probably key. Um, I think once we get that reclassification, you will see us being able to use that for housing associations and what have you. And I think that that will be, uh, I mean, we have been trying, uh, certainly when I was in the Department of Economy, to get more use for FTC because it's there. And uh, certainly when the money is there and can be used in Northern Ireland, <coughs> we much prefer that it is used here rather than hand it back. If Northern Ireland water was mutualised, would that open the door to them accessing FTC? Uh, it may well do. Um, it's something that I suppose Deidre will have to look at in terms of, of her department, but I would just like to see us across government be more proactive as to how we can use that money uh, that is there. It's not free money, of course it's not free money, but it's something that is there and, and we should be trying to make more use of it. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, Pat. Thanks, Chair. I just wanted to drill down a bit into the, the Brexit issue, and uh, I know the subcommittee has now been set up uh, and it's no secret that there are divergent views on that committee. So what approach is the committee going to take? And can you give us a flavour of uh, the future work plan of the committee? Yeah, so um, we actually, so I said yesterday, we had our, our first meeting. And it's important to say that all parties are represented on the, on the subcommittee because it's everybody has uh, an input to make. And because everything is so cross-cutting in nature, that mm. it's really vitally important that we work together across departments so there was a very firm commitment from all ministers present yesterday to share information with each other which probably isn't really how things maybe have worked previously but we're going to share information with each other um make sure that we're giving a heads up to each department and that we work collectively around trying to influence in the best possible way we can the trade uh, negotiations there is um um first minister and myself went to cardiff last uh, tuesday. last tuesday where we made a very strong case around the role uh, that we have to play in the negotiations. And we don't want to be considered as a, an annex or an add-on or a, a thorn in the side of, of the negotiation. We want to be in the middle of the negotiation. So we made a very strong case around uh, making sure that our voice was heard. And we were joined in that, obviously, by Scotland and Wales, who um, clearly will also be impacted. So we have uh, we've work to do. So we, we've agreed a, 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 um, a plan for the next I think it's five to six weeks around the, the areas that we're going to consider. Um, maybe actually we could we could share that with the committee. Um, yeah. It may change just depending on how the negotiation moves on. Um, but we've identified five or six areas where we we'll focus on. Um, but yes, we can certainly share that with with the committee as well. And I suppose I understand what you're saying about trying to influence the negotiations. But given that Boris Johnson has said that there's going to be unfettered access across the Irish Sea. Uh, and Michel Barnier and the Commission have effectively said the opposite, that the withdrawal agreement and the Irish protocol need to be implemented. How, how are you going to be able to influence the negotiations? Well, I, we did um, send a letter to the Prime Minister around the unfettered access piece. You're right, I mean, the Prime Minister is saying one thing and uh, Michel Barnier is saying something different, but that's not just in relation to Northern Ireland. I think that's just generally because they've restarted a negotiation now because we're in phase two. They're both taking up hardline negotiation stances. Um, I understand that, but from our point of view, we have to try and get clarity uh, in relation to the unfettered access piece from Great Britain to Northern Ireland and from Northern Ireland to Great Britain because the exit declarations for, for goods going from Northern Ireland to Great Britain, we don't want that uh, becoming a burdensome piece. And, and I understand that 
the economy minister today was in front of the economy committee and she was pointing out the fact that uh, what we don't want to see is increased costs and and uh, from, from goods coming from Great Britain to Northern Ireland and indeed a reduction in consumer choice, which should be of concern to us as well. What we want to see is that unfettered access being put in place. So, look, I understand um, we have actually um, common cause on a lot of issues with Scotland and Wales, uh, because if there are to be checks, of course, they will happen in Scotland and Wales and indeed in England as well. But uh, it is important that we continue to try and make sure that our voice is heard um, in all of the forums. The junior ministers have been um, to preparedness meetings in terms of no deal. We have been to the uh, JMC uh, in terms of negotiations. There will probably be a plenary of the Joint Ministerial Council. We have asked for it to be in Belfast in Northern Ireland um, in the coming weeks as well. So it is important that we continue to make sure that our voice is heard. Okay, thanks for that. And just one other short question. Uh, David Sterling was in last week and told us he intends retiring in August. Mm. I wonder has any process been put in place to appoint a new head of the civil service? And uh, would you expect to have a new person in place by the time table goes? Yes, that would be the intention. And we just received a submission from officials, which we're working our way through, just in terms of getting a, an appointment process in place. Um, but that needs to happen ASAP. So we're, we're very mindful of that. But our intention will be to, to have someone in place to, to step in straight away. Okay, Fran. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. It's very informative. Uh, in the last executive, there was a subcommittee set up to look at the whole question of mental health and mm. suicide prevention. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a belief that uh, it was very poorly attended. Mm -hmm. It sent out all the wrong messages to families. Uh, there's a growing expectation with the, the announcement of a new subcommittee. How can we uh, ensure that that's different than delivers to, to, to meet the expectations of families? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ryan. I think um, we were aware of that as well, uh, in terms <coughs> of uh, the fact that uh, it wasn't a particularly well attended um, committee. I think it was just called the Ministerial Subgroup on Suicide Prevention. Um, and when the Deputy First Minister and I talked about this, um, and we're keenly aware of the growth um, in this terrible blight on society, um, that we wanted to send out positive messages about well-being and resilience and uh, mental health and therefore uh, we felt that there was a need to uh, have a new committee uh, to send out those messages and working with uh, the Minister for Health uh, that has now been put in place and it is called the uh, Ministerial Working Group on uh, well-being, resilience and suicide prevention. So it's trying to take in all of those pieces and uh, we are committed to attending um, as First and Deputy First Minister because we believe it is something that we really do need to tackle. Thank you. Just a, one, a small question. Because I know in the past uh, one of the difficulties there's been uh, and uh, there has been uh, the, the, the lack of attendance or mm. input from other de de departments. And I think that's uh, the, the crucial element of trying to make anything uh, like this work, especially delivering for the, the, to meet those expectations of families. And that's why we think that um, promoting well-being and resilience and, and actually showing an executive commitment to it is really important, and we lead by example in terms of saying that this is a whole society approach is required, and also that you know each department will have a responsibility. So that's why we wanted to elevate it to um, to, lo to the level of um, joint office. We think that it's important just that this sent out a very strong signal from this is one of our maybe our first executive meeting maybe yeah. was the issue that we brought to that meeting because mm -hmm. we thought it was so um, in need of our, of our attention. So that's we're committed to, to working with the health minister but working across all the government departments to try and do better and do much, much more than what the suicide prevention group just did by itself previously. Okay, thank you. Okay, George. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Chair. And uh, can I welcome the ministers to the first meeting. Thank you. <clears throat> and could I ask the First Minister and Deputy to ensure that the future programme for government and investment flowing from it will extend to all parts of Northern Ireland, including my own East London <laughs> constituency. <laughs> well done, George. <laughs> which, which, which is in dire need of an, yeah. much, much needed investment. And we supplement as well. <laughs> what, 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 what politics is local, isn't that right, George? Yes, yeah, parochial. Yeah, parochial. It's a Coleraine Chronicle story. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, let me say this, George. Um, 
we recognise that Belfast mm. is our capital city because I know the man sitting beside you would want me to say that. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> say that. And, right. and is, a, is, a, is an economic driver. Uh, but we also believe, um, both of us fundamentally, that there needs to be economic development right across mm -hmm. Northern Ireland. And um, that's something that shouldn't be surprising given the <coughs> areas that we both represent, uh, Mid Ulster and Fermanagh and South Tyrone. So we do want to ensure that it is a balanced economic growth piece that is put in place. Um, some of our programmes actually do uh, intervene right across Northern Ireland. We want to make sure that that continues, um, whether it's TBUC or whether it's um, communities in transformation, or indeed if we look at what's happening at Ebrington site at the moment and, and the very good work that's going on there. And um, Michelle and I hope to go to um, the Ebrington site in the near future to see the work that is ongoing. Do you have a supplementary? The supplementary is in relation to um, the Heathrow hub bid. Oh, yes. just wondering if there's any update on that, which would produce quite a lot of economic benefit to the whole of Northern Ireland. I should know this, George, but I, I can't just remember what stage that is at at present. I know that they have identified uh, the possibility of um, the Ballykellys. Isn't the Ballykellys site? The Shackleton site. Yes, the, the, that site becoming the... Um, <coughs> There's a couple of sites. There's still a couple in. of sites. Yes, there's currently. a couple of sites still couple in sites. still in the running for the Heathrow hub. I think. Let me say this: I hope, I very much hope that we do have at least one Heathrow hub site, okay. logistics site here in Northern Ireland. Um, I know there's a number uh, across the UK still in the running uh, for the final four sites, but I think it is very important that we have one of those exactly. sites here in Northern Ireland. Can yourselves can you try and make sure that? <laughs> Hopefully that does, that does happen, <laughs> for the benefit of the whole of Northern Ireland, obviously. We will certainly try our best, George. Good, good. Can I just add, Chair, just, just in terms of regional balance, I mean, we're both committed to that. Um, we must get that right. Um, exactly. We have to see investment outside of um, the Greater Belfast area. I think that that's... Um, <laughs> it's, it's, I said balance. <laughs> um, but it is important that we do see a fair distribution. And I think that um, yes. even in your own constituency, George, when I uh, brought uh, the DART headquarters, the then DART headquarters, to Bally Kelly, that was a significant uh, which I message. Which for greatly. To, to, yes, absolutely. Which, that was to say that uh, this is our commitment in government to be able to address regional imbalance, but there's also obviously a lot more we can do in terms of infrastructure, broadband connections, everything that helps to make um, places a good place to invest in in the future. So we have to have regional uh, the needs of the regional uh, economy right at the heart of the programme for government and what we're trying to do here. Thank you very much. Thank you. As we're in constituency mode, just to say the <laughs> highlight of balance does suggest two extremes, but there's also a middle, and sometimes there's a ban just beyond the Greater Belfast area, but not far enough away to be considered uh, at, at a further side that gets missed as well. And oh, Stratford, thank um, you. Stratford, <laughs> which of course is a village in South Down. So um, yes, yeah, so there, there are areas there. Are. Um, well, I, I would have thought, Chair, you would know that all of Northern Ireland is Greater Belfast. <laughs> <laughs> so controversial. <laughs> anyway. Greater than Belfast. That's right. Um, I just want to start with some questions about um, historical institutional abuse. Um, during the uh, previous period before we went without an executive, there was a debate in the Assembly on this, and in that debate I indicated my very strongly held view that religious institutions are among the wealthiest institutions in our society. They sit on vast banks of property and land uh, worth lots and lots of money, and therefore I think they're in a position that they need to be making a serious contribution to the financial redress state failed because the state handed people over to institutions where dreadful things happened to them. But religious institutions also failed in terms of their duty of care. Has there been any indication made by those institutions that there is a preparedness to make a contribution to the financial redress for victims of historical institutional abuse? Well, I know that um, engagement is continuing. So back, obviously, before the restoration of the Assembly, in, in November um, 25th, I think it was, that um, the head of the civil service had contacted uh, six of the institutions um, and he started that conversation. But one of the things that 
First Minister and myself have been speaking <coughs> about is we've asked for a detailed list of all the institutions that including the churches who, who um, are involved and we think that we need to play or we need to get involved in terms of what we can do mm. and this is certainly one of the things that, that mm. we want to bring forward because back to the earlier conversation about how can we proceed at pace, how can we make sure that the, we get the redress to victims as best we can and as quickly as we can and then how do we make others play their part in that so that has to be a priority for us. We've just received as I said the list of all the institutions involved and then we'll have to go and um, engage with them ourselves. I, I do think that both of you should be unafraid to, if, if people aren't making a contribution, I think both of you should be unafraid to call them out for that, because we saw uh, in the Republic when Enda Kenny called out mm. religious institutions for their conduct, it shifted public opinion and it put a moral pressure upon them mm -hmm. to do the right thing by innocent mm -hmm. victims. So I would encourage you to be fearless in pursuing that cause. Um, the UK Shared Prosperity Fund mm. obviously going to have a role in replacing ERDF and ESF. Has there been any indication from government yet about one, how much is going to be in it, and two, how we go about accessing it? Um, no, there hasn't been in relation to the fund, but you're right, it's something that we will be pursuing, because um, obviously Northern Ireland has had its fair share of ERDF in particular. Um, sustainability fund, so it's important that the, the new prosperity fund um, comes our way, yeah. uh, and it's something that we will be very firmly pressing on, and I'm not sure the economy minister will be doing the same, and indeed the finance minister, but it's important uh, that we raise our voices, particularly at the <coughs> JMC. And when we looked at the different pots of money that was talked about in relation to the new decade, new approach, Brexit money was always separated out um, from the other uh, pots of money, so we need to find out what it is that we can access in relation to all of that. So, yes, that's on our agenda as well. Just related to finance, as as you know, both governments made commitments in mm. NDNA. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm just wondering if you could give the committee an update just on where the discussions are at with HM Treasury in terms mm. of honouring the commitments that they have made. Oh, yeah, so you're absolutely right. I mean, the NDNA document is the two governments are the authors mm -hmm. of, of the documents. Uh, all of the parties um, were involved in months of conversation around, you know, shaping up programme for government, things that we'd all like to see achieved in that. <coughs> uh, but as we know, the, the, the governments published the document um, whilst <coughs> negotiations were, were ongoing. But given that they have made these very public commitments, then we expect them to, to deliver also on the finances. And uh, the, the finance minister has been back and forth with the Treasury. Uh, we'll continue to do that on behalf of the executive as a whole. Um, and we intend to push very hard just in terms of getting delivery because there's a lot of expectation here, and rightly so, um, but there's a lot of expectation that we can deliver on all the commitments in the document. And if we're going to be successful in doing so, we need the finances to back that up. Um, so it remains a, a work in progress with the Treasury. Um, the Finance Minister will keep us up to date with that. But we also, we're obviously moving very quickly into the new budget, um, and we expect to see... Um, something uh, coming forward as part of that as well. So in terms of Barnet consequentials mm -hmm. and what that means in terms of policy decisions taken uh, in Britain. So um, we'll have to keep the committee up to date, but that's that's really where it stands right now. Okay. Um, in terms of our international strategy, mm -hmm. and um, I know that we obviously we have the offices in, in Brussels, uh, America and in China. Um, given the, the context of Brexit and free mm -hmm. trade is now on in vogue and all of that sort of stuff. I'm just wondering in terms of maximising our opportunities, has mm. consideration been given to opening similar facilities elsewhere in the world? And if so, where? Yeah, well, we've had a conversation with Andrew McCormick about the international piece, obviously, it's just an initial conversation. Yeah. Um, first of all, let me say uh, our thoughts are uh, with our staff in China uh, at this present moment in time, uh, as you know, uh, and indeed um, uh, with Madam Zhang, the Consul General, in relation to the terrible outbreak of uh, the coronavirus. Uh, China is in lockdown almost at the moment, you know, so there's not much happening there at present, and we do think of them at this time. Uh, the Brussels office obviously will have to be reorientated as well, um, given that we will not be inside the European Union structures anymore, but outside. So how does that work? How do we need to structure all of that? Uh, we have a new um, lead person in uh, the American office now as well, Andrew Elliott. Um, he is there um, replacing uh, the much decorated Norman Houston, <laughs> who has left, and we wish Norman well uh, in, in his new endeavours. But we do need to look at 
um, what else is there available to us and, and strategically are we in the right places, um, we will do that. Uh, but we are also very mindful of resource in all of this because when we set up the Beijing office, um, there actually isn't baseline cover for that in our budget. We are doing that on an ad hoc sort of basis, and that's not sustainable, frankly. We do need that to be baselined uh, into the budget. And, and if we were to uh, seek out another office in, I don't know, India or somewhere, I mean, yeah. that would be another challenge to us because we'd have to find the, fa the finances to do all of that. But yes, I think to answer your question, we will be looking at our international strategy, um, but we always have to do that in the context uh, of finance as well. And then just a final question, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, urban villages has had really positive impacts in my own constituency, um, particularly you just have to go and look at the replacement play park in Donegal Pass and all politics as local as was being said earlier. Mm -hmm. Is there an intention to expand the urban villages initiative, uh, you know, urban villages 2.0 or something like that into the future? Well, I think Urban Villages has made uh, a huge impact uh, in Belfast and indeed up in London Dairy as well. I think it's something that we will want to look at um, in the coming weeks and months uh, to assess the impact of, of the, of the programme. Um, you're right to say it has had a real impact uh, in terms of the capital uh, redesignation and also derelict buildings and what have you. And obviously we look forward to the new play park on Donegal Pass being finished. Uh, and, and being able to visit that as well. So, yes, we will look at all of that, but again, we'll have to assess how it has went. Was it value for money, to use the, the Vice Chair's commentary? Was it value for money? Did it make an impact on the ground? Uh, I think it will come back in a positive way, but then again, it'll be finding the resources and the finances to pull that forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Come up. Thanks, Chair, and thanks to yourself for coming in. Um, I just I suppose following on from some of the conversation that's been about the um, recommendations or the agreements out of the NDNA, um, there's a, a list of strategies outlined in the new decade, new approach deal. Mm. And last week we obviously had David Sterling, and when the question was put to him about how these strategies were going to be divided out uh, between departments, he told us that there was a body of work ongoing yeah. to divide these out and I was just wondering if that has concluded and if we have an update on, on which department is going to I'm just noting now that you're the only female on the committee. I've just noted that. Just that one over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have to be better diversity. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> um, so in terms of uh, of all the commitments in the document, what we need to see, and for even for the committee scrutiny role, we need to produce a table that actually says this is how we're going to, this is how each um, action is, or how it's been allocated, the time frame in which it needs to be delivered upon, and then you're able to, to chart our way through that. So we still have, or we just actually received today mm -hmm. a paper which which we'll be able to share with the committee in due course that will actually set out clearly, like each strategy at each action point, time frame for implementation. And then um, we can call, we can make sure that's relayed to the committee at some stage. Brilliant. I think I think and we talk, touched on this yesterday <coughs> when we met the chair and the vice chair. Uh, there will be a challenge for the committee structures as well as to how they're going to monitor all of this, um, because some of these things are cross cutting, mm -hmm. and um, whilst you as the the TEO committee will have the remit to look into this document. There are some pieces of it that will sit probably better in education or in DFC or whatever. Um, so there will be a need to be innovative and flexible maybe um, as to how you scrutinise this as well going forward, but that's something that we'll have to get to grips with. Um, yeah, no, just then more specifically than that, because I know Michelle you've made reference to the sort of rights language identity piece, and I'm just wondering, um, I've had some questions about the commissioner, and I know there was a, a, an agreement that there would be that would be worked out sort of within three months, or there would be a presentation made to to the assembly. So I'm wondering if the language is commissioners, if the process has started there, and, and how it's going to. Yeah, I, I think it has started, uh, but again, um, we will have to bring. And we haven't talked about the staffing of the um, TEO or anything like that. Obviously, when uh, the assembly was down, um, a lot of the staff were either redeployed or working in other areas, and we're now staffing up TEO again um, because there are some big pieces of work in, in the department, not least the piece that you have mentioned, HIA, obviously, victims' payments. All of these things have to now 
have staff to work up uh, the different structures and how they're going to be delivered. Um, so the officials have a big job of working, first of all, resourcing uh, the office, but then getting on with the job of work that has been set for them. And it is a very challenging time scale. If you look at that, that's three months. Um, uh, victims' payments, I think it's the end of May. Um, the HIA is the end of March, beginning of April. So all of these things are coming at us very, very quickly. We'll obviously have to come back to committee because obviously yes. there was draft legislation that was attached to the yeah. maybe the committee is going to have a role in <coughs> terms of that. So, um, given the, the three month time frame, at some stage very very mm. soon in the immediate future, we have to come back with the details of the legislation and give the committee its place around all mm -hmm. that. So. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I suppose it's more difficult come and last for most things that have been asked, but maybe following on from Emma's point, Anne, in, in terms of even what Christopher has asked about. The work that the finance, finance minister has done in terms of the well, I think I think the uh, deputy first minister's suggestion was that this, as it is, it is a, a, a government paper by, between the two governments yeah. presented and accepted by the parties. And there's been an awful lot of things, and some could accuse people of saying they're aspirational in terms of mess with money for these. Mm. I note whenever you were saying uh, the deputy first minister was saying about the money that we've went and seen the treasury in terms of Her Majesty's tre treasury, what work has been done with? the Southern Government in terms of them coughing up some money as well? Yeah, and they absolutely have to pay for what they have committed to, so we will be holding their feet to the fire on that. I believe that, um, I believe that the Finance Minister has also been in touch with them, but obviously there's an election happening in the, yeah. in the South, and I think that we'll, we'll know the outcome of that very, very soon, and then we'll be able to, whenever a Finance Minister and the Tannis is back in place, Taoiseach's in place, then we'll be able to go very firmly with pushing for delivery. We're not going to let anybody off the hook in terms of delivering on the equipment that we made. Well, well, I suppose from a public perception and all of this, I mean, probably are very visible in the two governments were involved. It was a two-government paper. Yeah. Um, but we're rushing across to uh, Westminster to try and get more money from that side. But we're not in a big rush to get... You know, in terms of even what's been publicly said, so I appreciate what you've said in relation to that today. There's another point raised, and this is probably one of my pets, and I, I probably, I know when my colleagues accuse me of being a very negative person, which I am. <laughs> but but Acknowledgement's always the first point, yes. isn't it, Trevor? And I, I, I that. Think. Fra asked a question about mental health, and I mean, I, I took encouragement from what the First Minister said in response to question time this week, I think actually in response to a question from Mike, about the mental health aspect of things. So none of us underestimate the value of what the mental health and what we need to do in terms sure. of tackling that. One of the issues I have, and given that you are the lead department of <coughs> the government, and, and, but one of the things I have seen, and this is a criticism of former government, is that each of the departments work in isolation in mm. terms of what they've done for mental health. Mm. And with all these different wee groups set up outside of that, so we fund community groups to do different particular pieces of mental health. And I have to say, I'm critical of whether any of that has actually ever worked. Mm. So at what stage will we actually take a fundamental review of all of that work before we spend this money, because I think there hasn't necessarily been work done in that in the past to say, well, are we actually get value for money for some of this work in the first place? Because we've heard all doing it in isolation, mm. and health being one, no criticism. I mean, people automatically think mental health falls with them. It doesn't necessarily. So I think we need to look at it, and I think that's why I took encouragement from what the First Minister had said the other day, that rather than forming another position for this, mm. that you're going to look at this collectively as an executive. And I think it's the first positive sign I've well, heard about well, mental health. Well, that is the plan. And, and to be fair, Trevor, I think your point about trying to collect in all of the actions and interventions that we currently engage in would be a useful piece of work to do uh, across government. Um, I slightly disagree in terms of sometimes the small groups of the people that actually make the difference. Some of those small groups are actually making a big difference um, to people's lives. Um, some of the more... Um, Big, big glitzy things sometimes I don't think make as big an impact, but certainly on the ground I think some of those small community groups do make a difference. The, 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 the thing for us to do now is to try and understand everything that's going on um, from, from the very smallest pot of money maybe given out through, um, there's quite a lot of money that comes out from our department actually in, in relation to this. But obviously health are very much involved, uh, DFC uh, are involved in justice in terms of um, some of the work around prisoners um, and some of the work about rehabilitation uh, are involved in, in money as well. So we need to understand all of that um, and then see where the interventions are working and where they're not. And, and I, I you, take that point. Yeah, and I that's why I took encouragement from your response yeah. that the executive is going to look at that collectively. Yeah. Because what, what, I mean, it does, the perception is that each department is throwing money 
Mm. What, is it really? And I mean, I think. Well, we that's what we have to find out. Is it really working? And just, yeah. just, Chair, just to put, to put on record, I mean, I, I mean, I agree with you. See, in terms of the work that's done on the ground by community groups, by volunteers, by charities, by people who are really, really passionate about intervention, prevention, you know, suicide, dealing with the actual real life in <coughs> suicide. The, the government couldn't pay for it. No. Mm -hmm. You couldn't pay for it because they're absolutely immense. But you always have to evaluate whenever government are paying for something. Yeah. You have to evaluate the usefulness of it. So right. I can agree with your point in terms of um, are we doing the right things and are we actually mm. all joined up in what we're doing? Yeah. And you know, people's mental health. What, what affects your mental health doesn't fall within the remit of the health department. Yeah. It's why not you have a job. It's why yeah. not you have you know yeah. if you're isolated. It's why not you have uh, if, if you're living in poverty. It's all those things. So we have to have a collective rounded approach to actually supporting people in life and, and making sure that we have early intervention and prevention as opposed to always dealing with things whenever they are crisis because whenever we're talking about suicide mm. it's too late. Yeah. Well no, I accept that and I think we're all aware in our own communities what they you know we can see and identify the problems. I think just previously I actually don't think we've grasped the nettle in terms of that's what, where, where we're going in direction with this sure. and I see where we're going in the right way. And that's why I took encouragement from what the First Minister had said in response to that, that the anxiety is going to look at it as a whole as opposed to looking at it in yeah. isolation yeah. or forming one department. The, the other one for me um, was the VSS in terms of the service itself mm. and the victims and survivors. And um, Again, I suppose someone who was previously involved with a particular victims group, um, I'm still wondering whether the value of some of the victims groups is actually getting to the victims mm. and whether there's any intention to do any work in the future in relation to that. I mean, I know that the department your department have invested lots of money in the sector, sure. but some people who have been affected by this see that um, there's been many groups formed on the back of this and the money's not direct getting really to the victims on the ground and some people have actually disengaged with some of their groups. Yeah. So is there any possibility of actually looking at and doing uh, it? I'm sure that Margaret Bates and, and, and VSS uh, do monitor all of that um, and, and do actually uh, look at what's happening on the ground, but I, I'm happy for us to have a conversation with Margaret around that, Trevor, if that's something you would like us to do. In fact, I'm, I'm sure she would come to the committee um, to answer some of those questions. Look, mm -hmm. it's always an issue between some of some of the victims groups are very effective and they are making a real difference um, uh, and then you find individual people who really don't want to get involved in victims groups mm. and it's very difficult to reach those sorts of people and that's the challenge because you have to respect that they may not want to be a part of a, a wider group and that's mm. just the way it is uh, and it's how we reach those people. Well, I, I suppose where I'm coming from in all of this, whether it be the mental health, whether it be the victims, yeah. that um, and it's back to money again. Mm. I mean, there's an awful lot of aspirational things in this new document, um, which is going to need to fund it. So I suppose those two things, was, which was areas which I always have been critical of, where we're getting the best bang for the buck. Yeah. Um, in terms of that, so I think maybe the new, that new thinking, and this, particularly in the mental health, yeah. um, because it's like anything, money will not fix it. Just throwing money at things doesn't necessarily fix it. I and suppose I think, it's about getting getting what we can with what we have yes. Trevor and I, I take on board what you're saying around that um, but people do get very um, closely associated with different little pieces that they feel very strongly about and I, I, I understand that as well so we have to be very careful as to how we look at all of these things but we will want to in, in the mental health and well-being piece we want to do things that don't necessarily cost money either in terms of trying to send out messages, positive messages about well-being and resilience um, from the leadership of the government and indeed from all in the Assembly mm -hmm. so that we can talk about this without a stigma being attached to it and, and have those conversations. So uh, I hear very much what you're saying. Um, we hope that this is a, a new start um, for us, raised it, you have raised it. It's obviously an issue um, that we very much want to see progress on. Mm -hmm. Okay, ministers, thank you very much indeed. That concludes. Everybody has had their chance to ask the thank questions. You. Um, uh, I did mention earlier about polite and respectful, but I can't always guarantee it will be this easy. I think we've had a good induction today, and uh, uh, we thank you for coming up and making yourselves available, and look forward to continued opportunities to engage with yourselves to, to scrutinise the work of the department. But Thanks, thank you very much for today. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Mm.
Okay, um, members, so just maybe on the back of the briefing, one thing that was referred to there was the Brexit subcommittee, and we know that obviously the issue of Brexit is going to be omnipresent and is going to um, contain a, a significant amount of work and concern out amongst the community. That, as it was mentioned there, that committee, maybe we could ask the um, clerk to write to the um, liaison officer just to get the commitment that we will uh, get the papers and the minutes uh, from the subcommittee so that we can get ourselves totally appraised on a regular basis of what's happening uh, on Brexit. Would that be possible? Yes, okay. um, we were having some conversations, myself and the deputy chair with the first and deputy first minister yesterday during the informal meeting and we're going to make a suggestion that just given, uh, I think it goes I think if my memory serves me right, Chris, I think you had mentioned about the international yes. um, work that really um, we have a sense that maybe it's going to be um, uh, um, an increasing issue as we move forward in terms of Brexit, just about the international marketing of um, Northern Ireland and how that reaches out to other places to tap in uh, for, for, for trade and, and work and that it might be worthwhile to get some research commission from the library just You're on... You're suggesting a trip to Beijing for the committee? Well, <laughs> not this month, maybe. This month. <laughs> they might hold off, but I, I think that maybe just to get um, some oh, uh, sort of maybe looking at the international relations approach that's taken in the other jurisdictions and from the other devolved institutions because um, I would certainly believe that there may be some work that we could piggyback on. And I mean, if there's things that the Scottish Government are doing or that the Welsh Government are doing, then there's probably a fair chance that we could also uh, be doing that. And also, if those places are out in certain uh, areas and are attracting uh, investment and setting up and establishing relationships that is beneficial and we're not then we're going to be at a detriment. So um, it might be an opportunity just to, to sort of have a look around and see uh, what the lay of the land is from the other jurisdictions. So maybe with members' agreement, we'll um, seek that research. And then if we present it, um, maybe it could be something that we could move towards an area of investigation um, just with the uh, impact of Brexit and the opportunities that that might open up for us. So if we have agreement for that. Agreed. Um, then we can move on to... Uh, Item six, then, which is the statutory regulations. <coughs> we have two. So I'll pass over to the clerk then to give us information on those, please. Okay, if you could go to page 85 of the meeting pack, uh, the Sex Discrimination Order <coughs> 1976 <coughs> Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2018, ends Regulation 4 of the Sex Discrimination Order. Um, Really what it does, it substitutes the Department for Communities for the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. Um, it's, I mean, it's a technical change. The regulations are simply being made to remove any ambiguity about the power the Department of Communities has to carry out a review of the regulatory system which implements the um, principle of equal treatment between men and women, um, specifically in the access and supply of goods and services. Um, since the papers were issued, the examiner of statutory rules has reported uh, and she's confirmed that she has no issues to raise. So it's just for members to consider whether they're content. 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 Yeah. Okay, if members are content, then um, I can put the question that the committee for the executive office considered um, SR 2018-194, the Sec Discrimination Order 1976 Amendment, Regulation of Northern Ireland 2018, and has no objections to the rule. All agreed? Agreed. agreed. Okay, so the next um, statutory. Uh, the Salaries Public Services Ombudsman's Order, Northern Ireland 2019. If you go to page 94 of your meeting pack, um, the Northern Ireland Assembly Commission has made the Salaries Order. It sets a salary for the Office of the Public Services Ombudsman. It comes into effect from the 1st of August 2019, um, but the, the Act provides that a salary order can have retrospective uh, effect and that's what this order does. It, it increases the salary um, payable with effect from the 1st of August 2016. Again, the examiner has reported um, since the papers were issued and she hasn't raised any issues. So again, for members to consider if they're content. Yeah. Okay, yep. members, we're all content. content. Okay, if that's the case, then we can put the question that the committee for the Executive Office considered SR 2019 132 
the Salaries Public Service Ombudsman, Order Northern Ireland 2019, and has no objection to the rule. All agreed? agreed. Okay, members, then item eight is the Forward Work Programme, which is available from page 100 in the meeting pack. Um, that sets out what we are doing, and just to remind members again, it has that initial eight, nine, ten week program where we're effectively taking a series of briefings uh, from various uh, parts of the Department of the Executive Office uh, and other bodies. And then, uh, once we receive all of those briefings, that will leave us in a better position to be able to look forward at some piece of work that we can move on to. Um, we have. Just to highlight, the historical HIA interim advocate is available to brief the, the committee next week. Um, so that is the 12th of February. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of um, oral evidences uh, next week, so that is there. And um, yeah, it's just for noting the rest of that then, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Okay. Yes, we also will be um, we're scheduled to receive a briefing on the functioning of government miscellaneous provision bill, which is the SPAD bill from uh, one of the member Jim Allister that was provisionally scheduled for the 19th of February. We've moved it to the 26th of February. Um, that's to allow ourselves to receive a briefing on the, the budget, um, which is uh, scheduled for the 19th of February at this stage. Um, and also maybe just to, to let members know just through some initial informal conversations that there might be a chance that the, um, that bill will actually come through this committee um, because just I think it's, there's several members on the finance committee that are sponsoring it uh, but there's still some conversations between I think there's another committee the finance the a, mm, perhaps, yeah. perhaps a the AFC. A or FC but we're settling that but um, I think at this stage it's looking like it might come through through here, so it's just to prepare members for that and that we'll receive more um, briefings after that. Well, I mean, it really is a personnel issue, finance and personnel issue. I'm not certain that this really is the home for that piece of legislation, and I think um, I really do think it sits better. I want to put on record. I really do think it sits better in the finance committee than uh, the executive office. I don't think that's sensible. So, so, I mean, and following on from that, then, who, who is really ultimately decides that? I mean, I think Christopher makes a valid point. Christopher, I think, makes a valid point. So, um, in the correspondence that is in the table pack there, um, it just it says that um, the bill makes provision for matters which fall within the remit of both the finance and executive departments, um, so it needs to be decided by those. But there are there's standing orders and that dictate what would happen on the occasion like this, and it's standing order 64. Um, so it's the, the, the conversations are, are still continuing, but I think the difficulty is that a sponsor of the bill is the chair of the Finance Committee, and that there, mm -hmm. Mr Alistair, who's also the other sponsor, is another member of the Finance Committee. So um, there may be... Sorry, the other way around. Mm -hmm. there, there may be potential for, for problems there, but what we do in answer to yourself, Trevor, is it goes ultimately, if there's disagreement, to the... Um, the business, the business committee, committee that then decides which which committee it goes down to. There are also opportunities for joint committees, but I think there's a sense that joint committees it starts to get a bit. Yes. You're getting 18 people into a room and you're 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 going on separate times and days, and it can get a bit confusing as opposed to it going to one committee and that committee farming out the elements to the other committee that it needs to get information on. So. Um, at this stage, I'm just informing members as an update. There's no decision that's been taken. And Mike, did you? I'm a sympathetic to Christopher's point. Yeah. Well, I'd certainly relay that, that that there's something to keep at the finance, and, and if there's if there's no overriding reason for why it can't, mm. but I get a sense that because the sponsor is the yeah. chair, that that might cause a problem. Sure. But we can. Do you remember just following on, whilst the individual would be the chair, what would prevent the vice chair from taking up the piece of work then? Is the sponsor not Jim Allister? The sponsor is Jim Allister, and the chair just got it the wrong way around. Mm -hmm. It's not the chair. Yeah, it's not. Mm. Jim's making clear in these table papers letter that he's mm -hmm. happy to appear before either. Either. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I don't, I don't think it's an issue that Jim's yeah. a member of the, the other committee. No. 
I'm happy to, to, to relay the guidance and, as I say, I, I would suspect that there's a finance committee meeting that's having exactly the same conversation as us right now, so no, well, I, I, if it ultimately needs to go up to the business what, committee... What are you suggesting them? they would want to pass the buck? Hmm? Are, you, are you suggesting they want to pass the buck? No, no, no. <laughs> are you suggesting we are? No, but I'm saying... No, what, what <laughs> are you saying we're doing the same as them? No, no, but what we're saying is it actually fits with them. It doesn't actually fit with this no, committee. It doesn't. it doesn't fit with us. There, there's some provisions that do fall to TEO, but as the Chair has said, Standing Order 64 makes provision for um, dealing with matters that are of concern to two or more committees. So discussions between the Chair and the Chair of the Finance um, Committee will take place next week and there will be advice taken from the Bill Office staff and, and the Clerk Assistant. So I suppose... Um, you may wish then this week simply to note the correspondence in the table yeah. papers and come back to it next week once we have a clearer picture. Yep. And I can certainly, taking the views that are being articulated here, can make sure that they're represented at the at the, the any discussions that we have. And Chair, what I would suggest is whichever committee takes it would be writing to the other committee yes. to say, are you content with those provisions which are, which fall under your remit? Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, um, I think that's just the correspondence then. Um, item nine, correspondence. There are three items of correspondence that begin on page 105 um, and one on the table pack that's there. So if you're content to note the correspondence in the main meeting pack. Yep. 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 No, okay. no. no. The three purchases, okay. Uh, do you want to give us an update on the content um, of them and what, why we're noting them? Just a... Uh, Two of them are requests to brief, um, two requests, requests from stakeholders to brief the committee. But we had agreed an approach last week that we would sort of keep a list until we looked at our strategic priorities, whether we're going to, to bring others in. The other piece of correspondence is the um, ISNI delivery pack system, the invest in activity report. So, unless you have any issues. You may wish to note. Yeah, no. Okay, happy enough to note. No, then no. we can move on then to chairperson's business. Um, just to advise members that the committee has been represented by the chairperson at the St. Patrick's Day events in Washington, D.C. for the past number of years. Um, the invite has been received again and falls to myself to ask Take for your permission task. <laughs> to carry the burden that there will be undoubtedly to represent you all uh, at the St. Patrick's Day events that are being held by the Northern Ireland Bureau in Washington. Um, are members content? Agreed. Agreed. And then um, it also, yes sorry, it does have an impact on the meeting on the 11th of March. Uh, as the committee clerk will also be in attendance, I think it's going to knock that one back for a week if members are content. Fair enough. Just oh, fun. No problem. <laughs> oh, don't be so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring you a sticker up. <laughs> um, are there any other business that members wish to raise? Yeah, Chair, it was just raised earlier on about the time and difficulties for some people. Is there any suggestion that the time of this committee could be changed? Hope not. Uh, as, as in for yeah. the member that wasn't are we talking about Trevor not being well I'm not specifically I, talking about him but is, is there room for any discussion around it no mm, uh, I hear the okay, second voice is only right now no I think I think it, as it's working for most of it uh, for eight of the nine I think it, it's as good a time as we're going to get but yeah. 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 all right okay um, members then we're back again next Wednesday at two o'clock in this room Thank you very much Hello. indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is